Hello and welcome to HPS Pharmacy's webcast lecture. My name is Sally Drake and I'm the Clinical Communications Coordinator at HPS. So this session will focus on menopausal hormone therapy and watching this session can be used to count towards your CPD points for professional registration purposes. So some definitions used in this presentation. Menopause refers to the final menstrual period and the typical age at which this occurs is between 45 and 55, with a median of 51 years of age. However, as there is no adequate biological marker for this event, the diagnosis is made in retrospect following 12 months of amenorrhea. And perimenopause refers to the transitional stage, um, around four to eight years, of increasingly irregular menstrual periods, leading up to the final menstrual period and the first 12 months afterwards. Postmenopause refers to the time after menopause occurs, and premature ovarian insufficiency is when menopause occurs before 40 years of age, and early menopause is when it occurs um, between 40 and 45 years of age. So there's quite a range of symptoms that could be attributed to menopause. Around three quarters of women will experience some symptoms, and around a third of women will experience symptoms that could be classified as moderate to severe. So probably the most well-known symptoms that we think of when we think of menopause are the vasomotor symptoms, so the hot flushes and the night sweats. However, there's uh, quite a range of um, symptoms that affect the urogenital system, as well as sleep disturbances, um, mood issues, um, issues affecting the musculoskeletal system. And a lot of these symptoms do tend to be more troublesome during the perimenopausal phase, um, in particular, the vasomotor symptoms. However, these urogenital symptoms do tend to become more common during the postmenopausal phase. So hormonal therapies that can be used include systemic menopausal hormone therapies, or MHT, and intravaginal estrogen. So MHT used to be referred to as HRT, hormone replacement therapy, um, and this change in name just helps to differentiate MHT from hormone replacement therapies for other endocrine conditions. And the goals when initiating treatment are to manage symptoms and also to reduce the risk of osteoporosis. And in patients with premature ovarian insufficiency, systemic MHT can also be used to, um, for the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. So systemic MHT is the most effective option for vasomotor symptoms. It can also help to improve sleep and prevent and manage osteoporosis. And there are three categories of systemic MHT. So you have the combined estrogen plus progestogen, you have estrogen only MHT, and those other options, which are tibolone and conjugated estrogens with basidoxaphene. So combined MHT is indicated for women with an intact uterus. Um, so the progestogen component is added to counteract the proliferative effect that estrogen has on the endometrium. And these combined options can be administered in either a continuous fashion or cyclically. So here are some cyclical MHT uh, formulations. Um, so these include medications that have a, um, an estrogen, which is given continuously, and then a progestogen, which is given for 10 to 14 days each cycle. So these medications do produce a withdrawal bleed, and they are appropriate for individuals with endometrial tissue who are perimenopausal or have premature ovarian insufficiency. So cyclical MHT is generally preferred for women who have had their last menstrual period less than a year ago, as continuous MHT can cause unpredictable bleeding in that group. Um, so as you can see, uh, there's low dose and there's medium dose options, and there's um, oral formulations as well as transdermal patches and gels. And these medications are supplied in combination packs. So for example, Femiston there, um, each pack contains 14 tablets with just the uh, estradiol, and then 14 tablets with the estradiol plus didrogesterone. And while the addition of a progesterone does significantly reduce the risk of endometrial cancer, the long-term use of cyclical MHT regimens is associated with an increased risk compared to baseline. 
Therefore, it is generally recommended to switch to a continuous therapy if MHT is still, still indicated after five years on a cyclical regimen. So as the name suggests, continuous MHT involves the continuous administration of both the estrogen and the progestogen components. So this type of therapy is appropriate for individuals with endometrial tissue who are postmenopausal or have been taking cyclical MHT for the past year and are now experiencing wider withdrawal bleeding, and also for those with premature ovarian insufficiency. And this type of therapy may also be considered for women who experience hormonally sensitive migraines. This product should not produce a withdrawal bleed, um, therefore some women may find them more convenient and the preferred option. However, they are generally avoided in women who are perimenopausal as they can cause irregular unscheduled bleeding in those patients. So here are some uh, examples of continuous MHT. So again, you've got the low dose and medium dose and you've got oral formulations and uh, transdermal patches. And moving on to estrogen only MHT. So this might be a suitable option for women who have had a total hysterectomy and they're available in both oral and transdermal preparations. Um, so it's quite a wide range of options here. You've got low dose, medium dose and high dose um, in those oral formulations as well as the uh, transdermal patches and gels. So for women who have a uterus, including those who have had an endometrial ablation or subtotal hysterectomy, if a, if a estrogen only uh, medication is prescribed, the woman does need to take an additional progestogen as well to just reduce that risk of endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial cancer that's associated with unopposed estrogen. Um, so if a progestogen is required, it can be administered either orally or as an intrauterine device or IUD. Um, so some oral preparations here, there's um, adopti progesterone, norethisterone and micronized progesterone. Or um, in the IUD, there's the levonorgestrel. Um, so the, the dose of the progestogen needs to match the dose of the estrogen. So if a patient is on a low dose estrogen, they would be given a low dose progestogen. Um, for the IUD, the Australasian Menopause Society considers a 20 microgram levonorgestrel dose um, to be appropriate for all recommended estrogen doses. Um, so the IUD can be inserted in the uterus and left for five years. Um, there's not a transdermal option for progestogen only, um, as the only uh, progestogen which is reliably absorbed through the skin is norethisterone. Um, this is available in combined MHT patches, so in products such as Estalis, but it's not commercially available as a single ingredient patch. Um, and for women who do have a uterus, a combined um, combination pack is generally preferred um, as they are, these are likely to improve compliance and also reduce medication expenses. However, it sometimes may be necessary for the prescriber to mix and match the estrogen and progestogen um, due to either intolerances or patient preference for a specific delivery method. Um, if this is the case, the patient really needs to be made aware of the importance of taking both components to ensure symptom relief and endometrial protection. So other options are the conjugated estrogens plus Bazodoxafene, which is um, in the Duovive product, or there is Tibolone, which is available in a couple of generic options, so Livial and Zyvium. So these medications can be used in postmenopausal individuals. They're not recommended for people who are in the perimenopausal phase as they can cause breakthrough bleeding. And an additional progestogen is not required with either of these options. So Duovive contains uh, conjugated estrogens paired with bazodoxafene, which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. 
And the combination of these two ingredients is known collectively as a tissue selective estrogen complex. So the conjugated estrogens alleviate the menopausal symptoms related to reduced estrogen production. And in the uterus, the basidoxyphene acts as an estrogen receptor antagonist. So it reduces the risk of endometrial hyperplasia associated with unopposed estrogen. Uh, the usual dose is one tablet daily. Um, and each tablet is modified release, so they need to be uh, swallowed whole, not broken or crushed. And moving on to tibolone. So tibolone is indicated for the short-term management of menopausal symptoms in postmenopausal women and as a second line agent for the prevention of bone mineral density loss in um, postmenopausal women at high risk of osteoporotic fractures. So tibolone is metabolized into three active metabolites. Two have mostly estrogenic effects and the other has mostly progestogenic and androgenic effects. And the effects of tibolone are also tissue specific. So these estrogenic effects are exerted primarily in the brain, bone and vagina, and they're responsible for control of vasomotor symptoms and prevention of bone loss. And the progestogenic effects occur in the endometrium to prevent hyperplasia. Estrogenic effects on the breast are limited, with studies showing no statistically significant increase in mammographic density. And the usual dose is just one tablet daily. And clinical trials suggest that tibolone may be less effective than standard dose combined MHT for the control of vasomotor symptoms, um, but does have a similar rate um, sorry, a lower rate of unscheduled bleeding. And the effect on bone appears to be similar for tibolone compared to uh, MHT. A large systematic review of over 40,000 patients was conducted in 2017 to investigate the benefits and harms of MHT. So um, per 10,000 patient years, estrogen only therapy in comparison to placebo was associated with 19 fewer cases of diabetes and 53 fewer cases of fractures. However, this was balanced by an increased risk of um, gallbladder disease, stroke, VTE and urinary incontinence. And when looking at combined estrogen plus progestogen therapy um, per 10,000 patient years, there was a um, reduction in colorectal cancer, so six fewer cases, 14 fewer cases of diabetes and 44 fewer fractures. However, there were nine more cases of invasive breast cancer, 22 more cases of probable uh, dementia, 21 more cases of gallbladder disease, nine more strokes, more than 800 more cases of urinary incontinence and 21 more cases of VTE. So most of this data uh, for this study came from the Women's Health Initiative, and this used oral conjugated equine estrogens with or without medroxyprogesterone. Um, so we know that the safety is likely to vary for different hormone regimens and as well as the age of initiation. So for example, the current evidence suggests that MHT administered by non-oral routes is not associated with an increased risk of VTE. And it is thought that this may be related to avoiding first pass metabolism in the liver. Also, micronized progesterone and didrogesterone may be safer choices for the progesterone component of combined MHT. And these medications are associated with lower cardiovascular, thromboembolic and breast cancer risks compared to other, uh, other progesterones. An initiation of systemic MHT in patients over 60 years of age is associated with greater risks. Um, so in these patients, there's an excess risk of seven additional strokes and 12 additional VTE events per 1,000 users. And in patients over 65 years of age, there's also an increased risk of dementia if combined MHT is initiated. So a global consensus statement uh, endorsed by international menopause societies was released in 2013 to address the risks and benefits of MHT. And this was further revised in 2016 to form the uh, following information. 
So systemic MHT is the most effective treatment for vasomotor symptoms and um, the benefits are more likely to outweigh the risks if initiated for symptomatic women before the age of 60 or within 10 years after menopause. And systemic MHT is effective for the prevention of bone loss in postmenopausal women, significantly lowering the risk of hip, vertebral and other osteoporosis related fractures. Standard dose estrogen alone MHT may decrease the risk of myocardial infarction and all cause mortality when initiated in women younger than 60 and or within 10 years after menopause. And the data for this statement is less compelling for combined estrogen plus progesterone MHT. And the risk of VTE and ischemic stroke increases with oral MHT, although the absolute risk of stroke with initiation before age 60 is rare. And evidence suggests the, lower, um, the risk is lower when transdermal therapy is used compared to oral therapy. The risk of breast cancer in women over 50 years of age associated with MHT is quite complex. Randomised controlled clinical trials suggest a reduced risk for estrogen alone and a possible increased risk when combined with a progestogen. However, it is helpful to put these risks into perspective. So the risk of breast cancer attributable to MHT is similar or lower than the increased risks associated with some common factors such as sedentary lifestyle, obesity and alcohol consumption. Uh, women experiencing menopause before the age of 45 are at a higher risk of cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis and potentially also affective disorders and dementia. So in these patients, MHT reduces symptoms and also preserves bone density and is associated with a reduced risk of heart disease, longer lifespan and a reduced risk of dementia. Um, and MHT is advised to continue at least until the average age of menopause in these patients. And MHT initiated in early menopause has no substantial effect on cognition, but may prevent Alzheimer's disease later in life. Um, this statement is based on observational studies. And when looking at randomized controlled trials, oral MHT initiated women age 65 or older has no substantial effect on cognition, but may increase the risk of dementia. So when it comes to estrogen alone, the best dose is the lowest dose that controls symptoms for the individual. And patients should have realistic expectations of um, the effectiveness of these medications in order to avoid unnecessary dose escalation. So for example, while MHT is the most effective treatment for hot flushes, it's unlikely to stop them completely. So studies suggest um, systemic MHT can reduce hot flushes by up to 75%. So there are a number of contraindications for systemic MHT, um, including age older than 60 at initiation and various cardiovascular um, conditions, as well as estrogen dependent cancers. So if any of these contraindications are present in a patient, the patient would need um, a specialist assessment of the risks and benefits um, before MHT is initiated. There are also some contraindications that are specific to oral estrogen. So that includes uh, risk factors for VTE, um, including obesity, smoking and thrombophilia risk factors for cardiovascular disease, elevated triglycerides and liver disease or, or gallbladder disease. So if any of these contraindications are present, a transdermal estrogen could be considered as they are associated with a lower risk of VTE and stroke compared to oral estrogen. Intravaginal estrogen is often considered separately to MHT as its absorption into the bloodstream is quite low. So this therapy is more effective than systemic MHT for treating the symptoms of vulvar vaginal atrophy. Um, and the following options can be used either alone or in combination with systemic MHT. So each trial is available in a cream or a pessary and estradiol is available in a pessary. 
So these medications are usually given as one dose, which is one pessary or one applicator full of cream, once daily for the first two to three weeks, and then once or twice weekly afterwards. And in comparison to systemic MHT, long-term therapy with intravaginal estrogen is considered generally safe. It's not associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, VTE or breast cancer. However, for patients with a personal history of breast cancer, a non-hormonal therapy would generally be preferred. So estradiol and estriol are absorbed systemically and following intravaginal application, uh, first pass metabolism is avoided. Therefore, significant plasma levels can be achieved um, following intravaginal application. However, at the recommended doses, absorption is not sufficient to cause endometrial pro proliferation or systemic adverse effects. Um, so for that reason, the addition of a progestogen is not required. So to summarise, uh, menopause is a normal part of the ageing process and not all women will require treatment. However, systemic MHT is the most effective treatment option for hot flushes and night sweats. And women who have an intact uterus should be prescribed a progestogen in combination with estrogen to reduce the risk of endometrial hyperplasia. So for most healthy per perimenopausal and postmenopausal women younger than 60, the benefits of systemic MHT generally outweigh the risks. However, there are some regimens that may confer a lower risk. Um, so for example, transdermal therapy, um, switching from a cyclical to a continuous regimen where appropriate, and also um, the individual choice of progestogen. Uh, the duration of therapy needs to be individualized um, and a review should be performed at least every 12 months to check for symptom control and also for the emergence of uh, new contraindications. So I'd just like to thank you for attending this session. If you do have any questions or feedback, please feel free to contact me directly at sally.drake at hps.com.au. Thank you so much for your time.